All right, well, this is going to be for HVR 110, the afternoon class, the first lecture. Turn my phone on silent. It just vibrates so it doesn't go off when I'm teaching. Um, this will be our first of a couple of lectures um, today. So we'll have it today at 1.30 and at 2.30. Uh, again, I, I resent out that invite uh, list for y'all. Uh, please let me know if you're having difficulty. Uh, if you see this on YouTube later and uh, you're like, hey, I didn't get an email, please text me, please call me. My cell phone number has been in all of your emails. All of you have my number because you've all contacted me at some point or another. Um, so just, you know, just communicate with me and I'll be able to fix any problem for God or any uh, miscommunication. Um, that way we can get everything settled, everything good to go. And I'm hoping with the next mod, we can get this a lot smoother. Uh, I've got some plans as far as uh, new interactions and new things I want to do. Uh, for today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over some slides and then we are going to do some simulations on the Cengage brain again. Uh, so you guys can see uh, different circuits and how they're going to function and operate beyond just your simple uh, series of parallel. We're going to go into more uh, things as far as thermostat wiring for a uh, heat pump, for an air conditioner, for furnace, uh, all these different things that we'll see, uh, and what we want to test, how we read voltages. Uh, we're going to go into all of that as well. Uh, I'm going to be uh, oh, had torn for a second. There it is. All right. So um, today I'm just going to go over some slides and then I'm going to do some simulations on the uh, Cengage brain after we're done with that. Just to show you guys uh, some different stuff as far as um, reading voltages and everything like that. I'm trying to, um, this uh, afternoon I'm going to be emailing um, the dean and trying to basically get uh, all of this Saturday for labs um, for all of my classes. Uh, and I'm going to try and set up a schedule sheet today and everything. That way everyone can sign up and uh, whatever time works for you, it can work for you. I'm going to have a couple of different labs going for each class um, uh, so you can get some work done. But I'm hoping to do that Saturday, this Saturday. So um, please uh, let me know. But again, I'll, I'll send out more details once I get more information uh, from the dean and everything. Um, so once it's approved and once I've got my times, we're going to get in there. We're just going to work and we have to stay very focused because we're going to have limited time. Um, we're basically going to try to set up one hour slots. I'd like to do two, but it just wouldn't work with the uh, numbers. Um, I'll double check the name. The numbers on Saturday might be more just because less people are in the building. Uh, I might be able to get more students in. So um, that's the goal is uh, Saturday trying to do just a ton of lab work because um, that's the day that's easiest with uh, the most access to the building. All right, so I'll go ahead, I'll get started on the slides. That way we can get done with that and we can do the cool stuff, which is actually the simulations. All right, so um, going into residential air conditioning controls, this is what I was talking about um, a little bit earlier uh, when I was talking to myself because I upload these to YouTube, so later on y'all will see that when I'm talking to myself. I sound like a crazy person, but it's okay. Um, crazy person about HVAC. Uh, so residential air conditioning systems, this is the control system when you start out in HVAC that you are going to come most in contact with. Uh, it is your thermostat. That's what we're talking about. Uh, so your thermostat is the main control that we've got. The other things would be your things like we talked about IFC boards or control boards, anything that has to do with solid state. Um, that's all code basically for uh, control boards. So we have to learn how to um, measure them, how to work with them, how to test them. There's certain ways you can do that. Um, 
you know, depending on the sophistication of the board, some of them will have self-diagnosing uh, lights and, and uh, signals that will tell you whether or not the board is in good condition. Uh, some of them have it where you can hook up a computer or you can hook up um, a flash drive to run a diagnostic on the system. Um, I've seen, uh, there's, there's a couple of different ones that, um, that go out there, but uh, the most common residentially is pretty much gonna be, you know, checking your voltages, checking your high voltage, checking your low voltage, um, testing all your different components um, and making sure that they're getting power that they're actually working. Uh, if the board for some reason is stopping power from flowing, uh, check and make sure your switches are closed, check and make sure that you know everything's operating as it should. Um, so that's the stuff that we'll we'll look at in a minute and we'll and we'll test out today. We're gonna look at a um residential HVAC unit once I'm done with these slides, because I really hate these things. I want you guys to interact with me when I get into the simulation. Uh, and I want you guys to basically tell me what the heck to do when we're in there. Um, I'll run through a couple with you at first and I'll you know, guide you through it, and then y'all will take over after about two of them. Um, all right, so residential air conditioning systems. Uh, again, remember these slides are all going to be on Canvas, or should be on Canvas already. I swear to God, I keep getting my classes mixed up. Which ones I, I'm pretty sure everyone's gotten Canvas at this point. I've just gotten the slides. If you haven't, let me know. I'll uh, I'll make sure to upload them again because I do it for one class and I think I do it for the other as well and sometimes I forget it happens. Um, so uh, packaged air conditioning systems, these will be used residentially. Um, I need to get it where I gotta get on my roof. Uh, I've got a packaged unit that's a residential unit um, at my apartment and uh, it's it works really well um, and it's nice and it's convenient and it doesn't take up much space. Um, but the only problem is it's on my roof so whenever it runs I no, like the whole house just because it's right next to a skylight, which is wonderful for noise. Um, but you know, stuff like that has to be come into consideration when you're uh, designing, when you're planning, when you're uh, working with something, you know, and maybe they couldn't have put it anywhere else. I don't doubt it. That probably is what happened. Um, but you know, hopefully it wasn't just someone being like, I hey, just put it next to the skylight. That'll mess with people for the rest of the time they live there. That would be quite evil. That's not the kind of HVAC guys I want y'all to be. All right, so residential HVAC controls. Um, the main thing to understand about them more than anything is the control boards and the um, thermostats. Those are the two things you'll have to understand. So um, you're gonna see, I'm gonna write this up here in a text box because this is something I wanna keep up here the whole time. Um, R, 24 volt power. These are what your different thermostat wires are gonna stand for. Um, y is your cooling call, W is your heating, uh, you've got uh, G is your blower motor, All right. your blower motor, that's your indoor fan, that's what I'm talking about there. Um, o All right, is going to be your reversing valve. And then you've got it where um, the only other one you'll see is usually B, which would be blue, which would be K, and there's your B, L, is usually B, K, black is usually your common. These two switch every now and then, and then blue is usually your data cable if you've got a really sophisticated um, system. So, oh, geez. there we go. Not going to leave this in a good spot. the background color. No, um, and this is this is the the, the uh, what the colors of the wires mean. Yeah. Okay. Oh, That's right. This is the color of the wires. Right. So um, those different uh, wire connections. This is what's going to happen. So um, a thermostat, and we'll see some diagrams of it and everything talking about how a thermostat's gonna operate. Uh, a thermostat is nothing more than a temperature switch. It's all it's reacting to. It's either reacting to an increase or decrease in temperature. Um, it react to a decrease in temperature when we're in heating mode, right? Because if we have it where it starts getting colder and colder and colder, heat needs to come on. Uh, an increase in temperature will activate our cooling mode. That's gonna activate our thermostat for cooling. So. Uh, that's when you're going to see um, 
you know, you'll have it where you have your two switches as far as uh, the style of them um, for uh, our thermostat will have um, normally open switch that will close on a rise and normally open switch that will close on a, on a fall, all right? And uh, that's when we're dealing with our, that's where I got a free hand it real quick because that's just faster. It looks terrible. Um, so we've got it where the temperature increase, all right, or sorry, temperature decrease with this switch, basically as the temperature decreases, you can see that line, that angle is going to literally fall and then it's going to make contact. It's going to fall and it's going to make contact right there with this line. And this is going to be where you're going to have your connection for um, your white wire. Um, this will be your W connection. So, And on the other side, we've got our R, got our 24 volt power. So this is how the control system is going to work basically on a residential system is it's going to have this 24 volt power coming from a transformer and we have to have that 24 volt power to do anything to turn anything on that transformer has to work so if the transformer blows system's done it's not working sorry the thermostat might be on only if you have batteries in it if you don't have batteries in that thermostat that thermostat will be off if the transformer blows it's that simple so a transformer going is a really common thing to happen, and it usually knocks out the controls. It's when someone, you go out to their house and you say, what's going on with the system? And they say, oh, it's doing nothing. The thermostat's not even on. Boom. My first thought, what y'all should be, is a transformer. So you're going to look for that. So remember, we got our R on this side. We're going to do the same exact thing. It's at 24 volts. But on increase in temperature, we're going to have it where it's going to be our yellow connection. And as that temperature increases, it'll close that switch, that 24 volts. What that 24 volts is gonna go to typically, it just depends on how the system's set up. But on your most simple systems, the W, when that closes, if we're going for a gas furnace, let's say, that 24 volt signal is now gonna be sent and it's gonna go to the, um, It'll go to the uh, control board or the IFC. So it'll go to, let's say, our um, harness control board. So IFC, that's what it's going to integrated furnace control. Um, you've got it where that's where that's going to be heading. And then for our yellow on the most basic ones, we've got it where it's gonna to head to two places. It's gonna to go to our, um, it's gonna send 24 volts to our blower fan, relay, or outdoor contactor. All right. So these two locations is where that 24 volts for our cooling call is gonna go. So the blower fan relay obviously is going to energize the blower motor. The outdoor contactor, when that closes, is going to energize our compressor and outdoor fan. Put it in here. So the furnace control board, if that turns on, if our W for heat comes on, that's going to be a little bit different um, depending on what kind of heating system we have. That's the reason why it's not as set as the cooling. When cooling comes on, it has to be running off of a compressor. There, there we have uh, very few. There are systems that run without compressors that use um, different styles of, of, uh, of uh, refrigerant and mediums and stuff like that that require no compressors. But uh, typically for Residential air conditioning, what we're talking about. Furnace controls, gonna go to that IFC board, typically to start a 
sequence of operations uh, to turn on a furnace, or it'll go to a sequencer to turn on electric heat strip. Uh, if it's a um, heat pump, it'll send, there's the W and then it's gonna send a signal on that orange and it's reversing valve that only plays a factor with the heat pump. So if you go to someone's house, before you even go to the indoor unit, before you go to the outdoor unit and start looking for a reversing valve on a system, you can know if it's a heat pump just by taking the cover off the thermostat. And when you take that cover off and you look at the wire connections, if orange is wired in and it's wired in as a heat pump, then you know, okay, yeah, I've got a heat pump. I don't have a gas furnace. Uh, if you just see a cooling call and a heating call, that means you've got an air conditioner with a gas or electric or oil furnace, um, or, or it could be a boiler, honestly. Uh, I've seen that before too. Usually boilers have their own thermostats though. That's the other thing. That'll, that'll be weird sometimes. It'll just be an R and a W. That's it. So the nice thing about residential um, systems is the fact that you've got it where you're working with 24 volts pretty much exclusively. Um, which is very, very low voltage, very safe, very easy. Uh, it's small wiring, um, and it's, uh, it's pretty easy to troubleshoot. It's not terribly difficult. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I think my seltzer the wrong way down. Um, <coughs> I thought I could breathe it in instead of uh, drinking it, but that failed. It was a good experiment. Um, all right, so uh, typically with air conditioning systems, you've got it where uh, residentially, you've got the package systems where it'll be a single unit on the outside. So you have your condenser, you have your blower pan, everything you have to work on is at that outdoor unit. The only thing inside the house is the controls, that thermostat. So it makes it kind of nice in the summertime or in the wintertime uh, because you don't have to keep going back and forth in and out and you're not getting like, I hate in the, in the summertime when you get, and you guys will understand this. You get really, really sweaty and you're outside and then you go into the house that's still hot and it's hotter than it is outside and you sweat even more and then you gotta go back out again and it's just, it's a nightmare. So rather than dealing with that, um, we have it where, uh, you know, having a package unit allows us to just go outside, quickly work on a system, get to all of the components at one time and come back with a full diagnostic uh, readout much easier. Problem with the package unit, it takes up a lot of space. Um, so it's either really bulky and it takes up a lot of yard space. Uh, it's really heavy, so it really can't be placed on a lot of roofs unless they're, you know, commercial uh, buildings or something that's, you know, honestly really old buildings. A lot of times you'll see them put there. Um, excuse me. So um, we have it where uh, those are going to be your simplest systems. They'll have it where they've got gas furnaces, heat pumps, electric heat. Uh, any kind of system you can have, you can have it as a package unit. The other more common style is your split air conditioner. This is the most common thing you're gonna see uh, for a um, residential system. You'll have an indoor uh, air handler is what it's called. Oh, she's mad. Um, we'll have an indoor air handler uh, and that air handler inside of it is gonna have your blower fan. So our yellow contact or our cooling is gonna close that blower fan relay. And the other thing it's gonna do is it's gonna to come to this outdoor unit. You guys have probably all seen this. You probably put your shirt over it as a kid and it blows it up and it's hilarious because um, it is hilarious. Uh, but you have it where um, that is your condenser, all right? So you're, you've got your air handler inside, you've got your condenser outside. That outside condenser, uh, that's where you're gonna have your uh, compressor and your outdoor fan motor. That's what your outdoor contactor is going to energize. So we have it where um, with the thermostat, just with a 24 volt signal, when that temperature rises and it makes contact, it continue. It just lets the 24 volts keep going through the wire because all it was is just an open switch. It's like if I had a switch on the wall and I left it open, but for some reason my switch just randomly closed because the temperature increased. And you can actually wire in like signals like that. You can put in lighting so that someone can know when their air conditioning system comes on. They can be like, oh yeah. Oh, close a contactor and let a light bulb come on in my office or something like that. Um, you know, uh, especially for some place like uh, um, uh, different commercial buildings and, and, uh, and restaurants and stuff like that, you've got a, um, a lot of stuff that they, want to be, that they might be concerned about. You know, if they've got a guy in an office and he's mostly working in the back and he's doing paperwork, but he's also trying to keep track of, you know, the refrigerators and 
uh, the walk-in coolers at the convenience store. You might want to know how often is that thing coming on. And if it starts seeing an irregularity, you know, the light coming on more and more and more, uh, you know, without any changes to, let's say, outdoor temperature or increase in customers, um, then he might, you know, know ahead of time, hey, look, my light's been acting up. I've been seeing it cycle on more often recently. Let me get a guy out here ahead of time, you know. Um, so it makes life a lot easier um, to do things like that. But besides the point, the main thing is the 24 volt signal is going to go to two places. The, blow, the blower wheel relay that, um, or the blower motor relay, that little tiny coil, remember that's underneath on those relays, that's where we're sending this. And it's going to, and that relay is going to close that armature. It's going to let power go through that 120. It's going to go straight to our fan motor. And um, you can actually wire it up where it can be a different speed on a fan motor, depending on what kind of task is it doing. Is it doing heating mode? Is it cooling mode? Is it heating with a furnace? Is it heating with um, uh, a heat pump? You know, and it can, you can change it according to that um, just by hooking up to the other side of that relay where that, where that armature closes down, what speed are you connected to on your fan motor? That's all you got to do, which leg, you know, if it's the high speed, low speed, medium. Um, but the uh, outdoor condenser unit, uh, indoor air handler, those are your two most common things you're going to come across. Residentially split units are pretty much used everywhere. Um, places that they won't be used all the time are typically going to be condos, uh, apartment complexes. Uh, sometimes they'll have uh, either package units, they'll do uh, wall through the wall units um, where it's uh, where again it's packaged but it's through the wall instead of on the roof or something. Um, that's really common. I used to have that in uh, my apartment uh, way back in the day. Um, and uh, so it's um, it just depends you know what's the space, what's the cost, what's the maintenance on it. That's what it comes down to and what's cheap as far as energy concer concerns are when the units and when the uh, building is being built. You know if for some reason that year, water prices and you know gas, natural gas were really, really cheap. They're like, oh, let's just get a boiler system in every single one of these units. And then 10 years go by and all of a sudden natural gas costs way more and water's getting more expensive because municipal systems are breaking down or something, you know, and it's like oh, crap. You know, so it's it's uh, it's stuff that they, you know, it's just gonna change building to building. That's the one thing I did love about uh, residential was when if y'all go into it, it's fun because you run into different systems, different problems, every single call, every single place you go, it's going to be something completely different. It's not heat pump after heat pump. The only time that it's the same thing all the time is in the summertime. It's a lot of air conditioners, but it's a different problem on every single air conditioner. And the air conditioners are tough and they are weird and it's it's not the easiest thing sometimes. So, um, you know, but when you when you get down to it, honestly, majority of the problems I've had with them, electrical. It's been signals lost, 24 volts doesn't go where it's needing to go or uh, never makes it to where it needs to be. And, uh, or a contactor is just not, you know, it gets 24 volts, but it's just not doing anything with it. Um, so all sorts of stuff like that is what we're gonna see. So, all right, um, like I said, control boards, this is our most common thing we're gonna be seeing. But if y'all look right here, you will see on this control board, right where I'm gonna circle in pink, all right, Right there, we've got it where there is a set of screw terminals. All right, each one of these screws right behind it, you unscrew it with your Phillips, you put a thermostat wire behind it, and you can look right there. R, C, Y, um, G, and W. All right, so R, power, C is our common, so that can either be a black or a blue wire, just depends on how the person who wired it up decided to do it that day. Um, common's the most uh, non-uniform uh, version of anything as far as uh, residential wiring is concerned. Sorry, there was something in, my, in the room. It's a stink bug. Yeah. Oh, Springtime. Um, so uh, we have it where these. Um, the control board, the main thing to check for is you're going to look and see these top terminal connections up here. These little blade connections are typically going to be your 120. So that's going to be your power coming into the board uh, here and here. Usually one set will be your power. 
One set will be neutrals, which is what these are over here. So you'll have all your neutral connections here, all your power connections here. Um, and you can check, you'll have two connections that'll be your incoming power. And then you'll have all your outgoing power. So you'll have it where it'll go. With this, you can see there's a lot more power than there is neutral. The reason is for that is um, we'll have like three or four connections. It will just be to one fan motor because it'll be all those different speeds. We'll connect all of them. And then this board can decide what mode, what speed that fan needs to be on. Um, and then uh, you'll have one going to an inducer fan motor and you have some optional ones that, you know, maybe the system has that, maybe it doesn't have that. Um, but it doesn't, you know, it needs less neutral connections because we only have at most five motors going into a system. At, I'm trying to think if there are five usually. Uh, yeah, you got your gas valve, which usually is, can be 120. You got your um, inducer draft motor, blower motor, and uh, your igniter is 120 as well. So that'll be, yeah, that'd be four connections right there at least. And then, yeah, your probably thermocouple coming back might be connected right there. Yeah, I don't know. Just depends. Systems change up every time, but boards are pretty simple. You can check voltage coming in, check voltage coming out. That's it. If it's not sending the, if it's getting the voltage in and it's getting the signal and it's supposed to be sending something on, it's not coming on in time or not coming on at all, get a new board. That's it. So there's a couple different control circuits. We'll look at wiring diagrams a little bit today with the, um, uh, when we go into the uh, Cengage brain uh, simulation. And then um, the, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see, you know, a compressor control circuit and all these different things. Um, so as far as air conditioning systems are concerned, your main and only three loads as far as 120 or 240, your high voltage, what's really going to consume power? Compressor, outdoor fan motor, indoor fan motor. That's it. Those are your three motors. As long as those three are going, you're going to get air conditioning. You're going to get cooling. Unless you've got a problem with refrigerant or you got a problem with airflow um, or, you know, uh, you got a problem with your controls. Those are much more common to happen than a problem with your motor. Uh, they can cause problems with your motor. If you've got a problem with your refrigerant level, if you've got a problem with your airflow, uh, that can eventually lead to issues with those motors. But you keep up, you keep up with that kind of stuff, that regular maintenance, systems last a long, long time. Um, so you'll have a few safety components depending on which kind of system it is. Uh, it will change every time. The most basic for an air conditioning system is you'll have it where there'll be uh, a temperature switch on all three of your motors to uh, turn the system off in case it overheats. Uh, and then you'll have it where there will be a um, high pressure and low pressure switch for a compressor. And that's it. That's, that, that's as simple as it gets for air conditioning. Um, the thing right here at the bottom that's noting, uh, package heat pump control systems, air to air and water to air. Um, you can use uh, water as a medium uh, as opposed to having to have uh, your outdoor con condenser unit uh, in, a, um, in the air outside to get rid of its air. It can actually, you can pump water across it. And um, that water, uh, depending on its source, can actually uh, can cool it off or absorb the heat or give off heat, um, depending on whether you're in heat or cooling mode. Uh, that has to do with your geothermal systems, which are super high tech, but are actually becoming more affordable. and extremely energy efficient. Like those are the ones where you get Energy Star House certified every single time as a geothermal system. Um, usually use, uh, the most I've seen those has been like a million dollar apartments is where I see geothermal usually. It's money because you got to dig a well and you got to, I mean, with like a 30 to 40 foot drill you need down into the earth to pick up the, basically the whole idea is instead of trusting the uh, outdoor temperature, you have a constant temperature buried deep within the earth and you bury your air can you bury your refrigerant coils down in the ground. It's the weirdest thing, but y'all learn all about that when you get into your heat pump and air conditioning classes. All right, I need to hurry up. So split systems, uh, again, basic condensing unit outside. Uh, you can have them in all sorts of locations off ground. Uh, I've seen them on second story decks. I've seen them on roofs. I've seen them uh, on um, hanging outside of an attic window, um, which was 
a joy to get out on. I've had them on tiny ledges that are, you know, a foot wide and have maybe six inches. So I've got like a one foot by six inch block to get both my feet out on, on a, like basically a little uh, hanging uh, thing up in DC. It was, I don't remember what it was, but it was, yeah, scared the crap out of me. Um, did not trust it. I was, yeah, I was not, uh, was not, not, I've not always been a little guy and I'm definitely not a little guy. So it was, it scared me, but you know, you got over it, you got to the unit and then you realize, oh, it's a really old unit. Let's sell them a new one. Um, cause I don't want to be out here that long. <laughs> uh, plus the unit was really old. Uh, cool guy though. He ran a dojo. So that was kind of nice. Um, so uh, airflow, that's the main thing you've got to have with these uh, split systems or even with the uh, package system. You've got to make sure that your coils are clean, make sure that the ductwork is clean, uh, make sure that, you know, uh, outdoor coil, that can get extremely dirty uh, because you have it where grass clippings or dust and debris or birds and critters and bugs are all over the thing and they're just, you know, putting crap all over it. Um, and that's really, really quick to happen. Uh, compared to the indoor unit, typically, typically, the indoor unit can build up a lot of stuff on it too, because it's inside, it's cold, it's dark, it's wet, there's usually some dust particles, there's some other stuff that might be floating in there, and then you can get some nasty biology going, you get mold and mildew, and uh, people typically will notice a smell in their house first, they'll be like, what's going on, every time the air conditioning comes on, there's like a funk. Um, and you've got to get, uh, there's treatments for those coils and everything like that. But cleaning that coil and then also cleaning that ductwork uh, is important to keep that evaporator clean, uh, making sure that you change your filters on a regular basis. Um, if anyone wonders, all right, guys, every three months is the minimum. Every three months is the minimum for changing an air conditioning filter, as far as air filters are concerned. For residential systems, three months is what I give them. Um, you should change it more frequently. If you have more than four occupants in the house at a regular time, like more than four people live there, um, you know, just increase it by one month for each person until it's, you know, monthly. So if you've got six people in the house at a regular time, you need to be doing monthly filter changes. The reason for that is the increase in skin cells, hair, you know, just general people coming in and out, bringing in dust and dirt and whatever with them. Uh, that the air filter is going to pick up and have to block. So, um, you know, it also increases if you have it where, you know, maybe you've got three people and not four, but you've got seven dogs. That will make a difference. Um, I remember one time there was a, I went to a haircuttery and I went to go get a haircut and man, I wish we could go back and do those now. Um, I need one. Uh, but the, uh, um, I went in and I was asking them because their air conditioning was not working. I was sweating in the chair. I was like, oh my God, this is uncomfortable as heck. And uh, they had an option. It was, uh, they had like hot towel or cold towel. I was like, cold, ugh, like I'm not dealing with it. I'm already hot enough. So they, um, I asked her, you know, I was like, hey, so what do you guys do for your air conditioning system? She's like, oh, well, we just, you know, the landlord takes care of it. And I'm like, how often is he changing your filter? Oh, they haven't changed it in probably like four or five months. The guy hasn't been out here. You kidding me? Like, you're a hair cutting salon. You need to be changed every like 15 days because the amount of stuff that gets picked up just because that thing's going to cycle on. And yes, people are going to be in the middle of right there. The hair is going to be cut and it's going to whisk away. Um, you have to, you have to take that stuff into account. So if I'm a landlord and I'm signing a lease out to, you know, uh, a, a hair salon in one of my spots in a strip mall or whatever, I need to know that, yes, this is going to be an increased cost on air filters. I'm just going to have to change them more often. Uh, and I might have to learn how to do that. Uh, I know guys that are willing to do that. Uh, if there's guys that you find out, you know, you work for, you go out and see, and are not willing to do that kind of stuff, talk to them about it. Be like, hey, look, this is something you need to do to make yourself, you know, save money and make sure the system works properly. Um, and increase revenue for this business, and then they're also going to stay probably longer for you. So, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. So heat pumps, um, same exact thing as an air conditioner. We've got indoor evaporator. It's going to be ice cold. Heat travels from hot to cold. So we take in hot air from the inside. We throw it across this cold evaporator. The cold evaporator is going to absorb the heat out of that air. It's going to cool that air off. The air is going to condense. It's going to be, uh, it's going to take up less space and it's going to be colder. And then it's going to return back out into our 
living space. Um, and then the outside unit is going to have a really hot condenser coil and it's going to bring outside air across it and it's going to be hotter than the outside air. So if heat's going to travel from hot to cold and it's going to put heat off into that outside air. So we absorb heat at the evaporator and we put heat out at the condenser. That's the whole idea with an air conditioning system. With the um, heat pump, it does it in reverse. So our evaporator that's inside, now it's going to put off heat and our condenser that's outside is going to absorb heat out of it. Um, this is uh, one of the most common systems that you're going to see in Richmond and in Virginia especially. It's very, very uh, typical because it's energy efficient and it doesn't require anything more than electricity. You don't have to have any fuel, you don't have to have any gas, you don't have to have propane, uh, you just need electricity and that's it. And electricity is really easy to run out to people's houses. Um, it does not take a lot to uh, run some power lines out to a neighborhood and uh, you know maybe if it gets really big you have to install a new substation or something or upgrade the one you've got but it really isn't uh, too too hard to do that kind of stuff like so especially like out in the country you'll see this a lot because uh, uh, their other option is they've got to have a fuel oil tank that has to keep being refilled or a propane tank um, that has to keep being refilled uh, or they could just get electricity and just you know deal with the bill from Dominion all the time um, so uh, the one thing with the heat pump control systems that's different is this is the one that I remember said is going to include that orange wire for that reversing valve. The reversing valve is going to switch the flow of refrigerant from heating to cooling or cooling to heating. Uh, depending on which brand it is, it'll energize it either way, but uh, it's what's actually going to control once we're, you know, we have a call for heating, we have a call for cooling, it's going to say, okay, go into heat mode, go into cool mode, whatever it needs to do. Um, so, um, the whole thing with it, that's the problem that happens with the heat pump is you have one big downfall. All right. That outdoor unit is going to be, uh, uh, absorbing heat over and over and over again. All right. Now, as it gets colder outside, it absorbs more heat on it. All right. It's going to cool off. It's going to cool way down. It's going to get to the point where it actually starts sweating like a glass of iced tea almost. And then that water, because it's so cold outside, will eventually turn to ice. You will actually see, and you've probably looked and seen, and you know, you walk around, you've probably seen an air conditioning unit or a condenser outside running in the wintertime, and it's got a band of ice on it, or it's a whole block of ice is what it's made out into. Um, that usually happens when the temperature gets to about freezing. Once it gets to about 40 degrees outside, these units typically start freezing up. So they have to go into a defrost cycle. So the easiest way to defrost that outdoor unit, well, if we throw it back in air conditioning mode, hot refrigerant's gonna be back out at that outdoor coil again. So let's throw it in air conditioning mode. And that's what the defrost cycle basically does. It throws it into an air conditioning cycle in the middle of the winter, so not the best way to heat a house, but it turns on electric heat to overcome that. Um, but the energy cost of that is, is pretty up there. And that's, that's one of the downfalls of, of a um, heat pump system is when you have really cold winters, um, it, can, it, it won't be able to hold up. It's gonna go, it's gonna consume a lot of power. So for Virginia, we're right on the border, North Carolina, South Carolina, this is all you see. Um, but Virginia, we're right on the border of whether or not we can use a heat pump year round. Uh, so people will uh, have really powerful electric furnaces or they'll have backup gas heat. Um, will be another thing. So uh, that's all the different controls that we're going to see and have to operate with a heat pump. The big thing that's different more than anything else is it's got the defrost cycle and that reversing valve. Um, again, you'll learn more about these and you'll have actual hands-on experience with the heat pump systems once you get into the class with that. Um, and uh, you'll be able to see all the different, uh, you know, how everything's going to be working for it. Um, so thermostats, they've got a lot of different styles of them as far as how they're gonna wire them in and, and have them working and everything like that. Um, you can have it where it's one or two stages of cooling and heating um, <clears throat> on your thermostat. Uh, remember, it's gonna be those same uh, letters and everything like that every time, uh, or the same colors. So the difference will be you'll have where it's you know Y1 and Y2 for first and second stage of cooling, or W1 and W2. 
So this is a really common one for residential systems. You'll see first stage heat, which will be a heat pump. And then second stage, which will be electric heat. Now that could be a, they can put a gas furnace in that way uh, if they want to, but typically it's electric. That's what you're gonna see a lot of times. And this can be, this is what you're gonna see a lot of times um, for a commercial building is a package unit commercially will have um, two compressors, two condensers, two outdoor fan motors, and basically have two systems running parallel next to each other. Um, and when they do that, they'll have it where it'll cycle on between first and second stage of cooling so that the system doesn't get worn out all at once and each system can take really considerable long breaks uh, in between turning on and going into cooling mode and everything. So, um, cool stuff. All right, uh, advanced controls you're gonna see depending on what kind of system it is, it's usually a control module. So basically everything, this is stuff I've talked about before, communicating with, communicating with microprocessors, with computer boards and all that kind of stuff. Uh, again, you're just checking, same thing again. Am I getting voltage? Is it going to my components? Are they turning on? What's wrong with the system? Um, you know, if you chase voltage all the way to the, to the motor and it's there at the motor, and the motor's still not turning on, start checking your motor, start checking your capacitor, you know, all these different things. So, um, zone control systems are very, very popular. They're getting to become more common nowadays. Um, basically, what you have is in your ductwork, imagine a bunch of doors, all right, that close off in the ductwork and open electronically. It's a little motor just opens and closes. And at the end of that ductwork, in each, behind one, each one of those dampers, those opening and closing doors, is going to be a thermistor or a temperature sensor that will tell the system, hey, I need to be at this specific temperature, here's where I'm at, and it will open and close and let air go to where it needs to go. So, you know, you won't have a hot, cold room, everything will heat and cool evenly, so. Zone controls, they usually have their own independent board because they require so much uh, data information. So they'll, they'll, they'll be a supplemental system, they'll be extra on top of uh, you know, the control board for the air conditioner or the furnace. You'll have a second control board just for zones. All right, I'm gonna try to finish these up as quick as I can. Mini split control, super simple. It's a remote control. Like that's typically all it ever is, is a remote control on the wall. Uh, you've got where it's a really complicated control board. It doesn't take a lot to diagnose it. It usually has a lot of codes and then a manufacturer that gives you a whole lot of information. Uh, field wiring, you've got two different kinds. You've got field and you've got factory wiring. Field wiring